Good afternoon, uh, my name is Robert Shemelinski and I'm one of the staff at TEDxBeaconStreet.com. I am here interviewing Chris McCaskill, who just gave an amazing talk about his journey up to now and we're going to continue it with a few questions that will go a little bit deeper and maybe answer a few more questions that you might have when you listen to his talk. Chris, um, you have a very interesting youth yeah, and, that's for sure. and, it's, and it, it is quite different from where your life ended up taking you. Mm -hmm. can you. Can you elaborate a little bit on what you have carried with you from your youth, what parts of your character that you still hold very close and identify with? Mm -hmm as you've gone into the kind of success that you've seen in life? So I think the first thing I want to say is uh, what I didn't include in the talk, and I probably could have, should have, is I went through a lot of traumatic youth, but I had something that a lot of kids don't have. I knew my mom adored me. Every minute of my life, I knew my mom adored me. Despite all the hardships we went through, stories I've never told, can never tell, they're too crazy. Um, so that's number one. Number two, uh, you get terrific empathy. When I see someone who's homeless and I think about whatever it is, drug, ad drug addiction or economic hardship or schizophrenia or whatever it is, you have tremendous empathy for them, whereas most people don't understand them, they're afraid of them, they think they're dangerous or something like that. I, that's not me. I, I, I can go talk to them and strike up a conversation, go buy them a chicken sandwich or something like that. So the empathy is, is a huge aspect. One of the things you mentioned was how you were screaming in juvenile court, you ran and you just went to, to go and disappear, mm -hmm. all right? And you, you just finished talking also about the empathy that you're able to have mm -hmm. for people in the same situation. How do you... Um, how did you feel? I mean, could you, do, you, do you recall what was going through you, um, yourself emotionally when that happened? And has that been what's helped you to connect with, with other people in similar situations? So I recall it very distinctly. The number one thing was humiliation. It was just so embarrassing. You're dirty if you're homeless, and people just look away. They're, you'll see a, a cute girl walking down the street, and the adults will go, ah, oh, but they just glance at you for a second, and they look away. And, you're done. So it's there's humiliation. And a lot of the times that I ran was because I got embarrassed in front of the class and it was humiliation. The other was fear. In the courtroom, it, when I couldn't stop screaming, it was just fear. I was afraid I was going to San Quentin and, you know, I'd be locked up for life. Because that's <coughs> what your mother had told you if that's you skipped school. That's what my mother school. had told me, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the third thing that's gotten me later in life is a little bit of sorrow, sadness for what happened to my mom. Schizophrenia is such a cruel disease. And so that's what you were seeing a little bit of on the stage when I was having trouble keeping my composure. Just sadness. I miss her. I adored her. And she just, it was so cruel, the disease that she got. But it does, all three of those emotions help you connect to people who have those, who are fearful, mentally ill, you know, have been humiliated. Nobody likes to be made fun of. And when that happens, you can relate to it because you were there. And you, you know what it seems as, as you're talking that, that, Deep down, your mom was a, a true gem of a soul, and it was the you know it was the chemistry that she inherited or took on yeah. somehow, and that that was the layer that was a layer mm -hmm. over that gem, and that's probably mm -hmm. why you connect so well with people who are in a similar similar situation because deep down they also have that gem, yeah. okay, and you see it because you saw it in your mother, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, and, and as a result of, of your relationship with her, you could not deal with Shakespeare. And you had plenty of horrible experiences in English and failing and failing. What about today? Uh, you know, I can't, I still can't do Shakespeare. I try to think of myself as a well-adjusted adult, you know, who's over all my hang-ups and I can talk about things now and all that. I can't talk about Shakespeare. I just, I can't. If I hear a quote from Shakespeare, I just... It makes me think of my mom, and I just get too sad. I just can't. Mm -hmm. so. Do you, uh, you, you talked also about your speech at Stanford and how uh, the comments you heard with that, it was the best speech that, mm -hmm. some, that people had ever heard from a student. Mm -hmm. Do you recall now what the, on reflection, what, what was the most powerful thing in your talk 
that really impressed these people? Did they tell you? Uh, they didn't tell me, but I uh, tried to model this talk around the one that I gave at Stanford. And I think when you could hear a pin drop, it was when I was being locked up in juvenile hall, I was screaming in court, uh, all those times where they couldn't quite imagine how a child like that gets to be a well-composed, confident, or seemingly confident graduate student at Stanford. And they thought it was a miracle, and so did I. So the, uh, the transition. The transition. That, yeah. that really struck them. Yeah. That really struck them. Amazing. And for, for all of us out here in the audience, the people who are going to watch this interview, the people who heard your talk, mm -hmm. How do, we, how do we recognize our superpower? I mean, assuming that we all have something, we all have something unique that maybe we consider to be a detriment or a character flaw or some kind of defect. Yeah. How, do we, you know, how do we go about seeking that and finding that? Can you have any advice? You know, I think it comes down to differences and that's why I chose difference in the title. It's not necessarily weakness or psychological hang up or imposter syndrome or anything like that. It's just difference, and it's mm -hmm. difference in what you love, in life's experience, something that gives you a different outlook in life. When Greta Thunberg said her differences are superpower, she said, it's not good for us all to be the same. We need people who are different because that's what makes the magic. And I think you're just looking for difference. And that, in fact, that's the point of a book that I've seen cited so many times called The Medici Effect, mm, yeah. where in order to get the best product or the best result, the best solution, you need to pull in the most diverse group of advisors and participants as possible. And that's the only way you get to the highest value. Because if you get the same type of people in the room, you're going to get the same answer yeah, I agree with from that. all of them. Yeah. I know there's a great fear of immigration in our country, but when you think about, we had a Lyft driver who was Lebanese, he was fascinating to talk to. When you think about, we are the melting pot of different people, and we have become the world's superpower. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. By combining all those differences. Mm -hmm. so. and, and I just, I just hope we don't forget that. Yeah. All right. I know. I agree. And it seems like we're getting damn close to forgetting I know. it. I agree. With so, you. a last question. You're also familiar with another person who spoke at uh, Stanford commencement, Steve Jobs, who yes, you worked great, with yeah. for years. Mm -hmm. And he talked about connecting the dots mm -hmm. and, and how that happens somewhat serendipitously mm -hmm. in our lives. Can you give us your own, your own take on connecting the dots and how it worked in your life and, and how it might work for the, for the rest of us? Yeah, so that's the interesting thing is Steve was talking about how he got into typography at Reed College. And he just really got interest, interested in how the fonts were formed and all of that. And he didn't see the application of that. And I didn't see the application of that at Next Computers and so on. But looking back with the Macintosh and the Next and OS X and so on, you could connect the dots and say, hey, that typography was really interesting. He thought he was just pursuing it as a passion. And there's so many things like that. You, he said you can't see it going forward, but you can connect the dots looking back. And there's so many things in my life that are the same way where I think, hey, the reason I was able to talk him into giving the Unix Expo speech is because I was a scientist and I didn't believe what Unix weenies had concluded about, you know, uh, putting a graphical user interface on Unix being a bad idea. So I stood my ground with Steve where no one else was willing to, and that made all the difference. All right, but there was a point in your life when you did connect enough dots that your life turned around. Do you recall yeah. when, when that happened? Yeah, well... And what that felt like? <laughs> that was a surreal experience. I think if I had to pick one time, it would be at Stanford when I gave that talk. And I decided to speak publicly for the first time of growing up on the streets and how it affected me and gave me appreciation for higher education. I thought the talk bombed. I, I had my instinct to run. I thought I died and I just wanted to run away and forget it. And, but then other people approached me, like the Dean of Earth Sciences, who was my advisor and my great hero in life, and he said it was the greatest talk he'd ever heard a student give. And it was at that point I was in total disarray because I was thinking that was the worst talk I'd ever heard a student give. And then I started to connect the dots and think, hey, you know, this crippling weakness that I have, 
that has humiliated and embarrassed me and I've kept secret all this time. Maybe, actually, that might be why I thrived at Stanford, looking back on it. And that changed my outlook on life. Well, let's hope that we all can connect the dots, okay, at some point. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, audience. And I hope you all tune in on Chris's TEDx talk when it gets posted. Thank you. Thank you.